This session uh, is advertised as dealing with short-term tactics, and I had, you know, 10 minutes of things to say, but I'm going to uh, just uh, cut to the chase. Uh, in this particular session, I would really like to get our panelists, uh, initially this group here, to talk about what we should be doing in the next three, four, five months, and specifically uh, some of the things on the table. Do we want to once again occupy public parks? Advantages, obviously, one of them has been mentioned, the press has something to talk about. Uh, um, it's a great place to exercise participatory democracy, to liberate territory and so forth. Disadvantage, uh, it, it takes the movement and, and has to be more about that than about organizing in other possible ways. Uh, for example, instead we could be trying to organize, uh, and by the way, they don't have to be one or the other, but in any case, uh, how much time spent occupying a park is taken away from time trying to organize a student loan strike. Student loan strikes don't just happen, they are incredibly, incredibly arduous, that kind of organizing, similarly uh, debt kind of activities. Uh, uh, I mean, larger debt, uh, mortgage debt. Uh, there's a tremendous population. One of the fascinating things about uh, debt is it cuts clear across political divides. There are probably as many Tea Party families who have trouble with their underwater mortgages as any other sort. Um, uh, so to what extent do we want to focus on that sort of thing? To what extent do we want to focus on one-shot demonstrations? Um, uh, or, you know, that sort of gesture, which can parenthetically be very effective politically um, uh, in terms of media. Uh, specifically, uh, the G8 conference, I really do want to spend a little time talking about this because I frankly myself view the Chicago G8 meeting as a potential, uh, it could potentially be quite effective, it could potentially be a complete disaster in terms of movement building. Uh, along the uh, first time tragedy, second time farce dimension. Um, there similarly is talk of a May Day strike, organizing a May Day strike. One thing that has to be said is that is a huge amount of organizing and it may not be the time to do it. It's one thing to do a May Day strike in Greece right now. It may or may not be interesting to do that right now here. Um, and then beyond that, just to note in passing that there's an election about to happen. And, and does it, and should time be being spent on the, there's two different things to be said here. Should time be being spent working for candidates and not necessarily at the presidential level, but working for candidates who could address some of the kinds of things we've been talking about? Should some of the time be spent there? And conversely, even if you, if you say, let a, let a thousand flowers bloom and let all kinds of things happen, to what extent does the activities that people in uh, in uh, Occupy Wall Street do have the potential of upending the efforts of other people who are trying to uh, work on that side of things. Um, and the, again, the, the model of Chicago in the streets in 68 is pertinent to thinking about that. So without further ado, I want to pass this on to, uh, well, for starters, you, Biola, and, and, um. and just your thoughts on some of that. Cool. So when I think about like, I mean, at CUNY, we've thought of a lot of people have like flirted with the idea of uh, occupation. Um, I think, I mean, and it's been done before in like 69, uh, 89 and 91. And I think it's important if we think of occupations, it need it needs support. Like we can, the thing, the reason why it failed in 91 is because they were able to divide, the students weren't, weren't as united. And Many people have spoken of the tendency of um, people to sort of fetishize, fetishize occupations, and I think that is a, I mean, and it was kind of evident there was like an occupation that someone spoke, to, spoke of um, that happened like up the block that like was kind of a hot mess, and I think it was because people weren't, uh, you, people weren't united, um, and there wasn't really like that much of a goal, and I think um, as far as uh, organizing around debt strikes and student loan debt, uh, we, need, uh, we need to be working to shift um, everyone's consciousness about about uh, students. Like students are not just um, you know t twenty year olds like me um, who I don't know have like spare time on their hands and stuff. Like we need to think of like student loan and student debts as family issues. Because like st student debt, like five 
most people default with like $5,000 in student debt, and that's because they weren't able to finish because they had all these other issues going on. And we really need to think of it as family issues and, and address it and, and addresses it such if we want to really build um, a real deep support for it in, in, before we even think about, I think, occupying a, occupying a space. And I think, especially at CUNY, where most of the students are uh, people of color who don't, or, or working class, we, um, we can build that, but we need, we need to like really act, actively uh, do that. Um, yeah, I ran out of thoughts. Uh, can, can I just ask you a, a question about the student loan thing? Um, a few specific issues about student loan. One of the things that as some of you may not know is that there were some real clever little laws that were passed, uh, late Clinton, early Bush, uh, that unlike any other kind of loan there is, student loans cannot be discharged in bankruptcy. It is truly an astonishing uh, piece, piece of legislation and it, it, it makes it all the more difficult and people are all the more isolated because of that. Um, in terms of, or and then the other thing, obviously, to say about student loans is that that you know adults, you know not adults, but you know fifty-year-olds, six-year-olds, so well, why should they discharge their debts? You know, I better should get through school, and I've paid my debts. You paid your debt for about five thousand dollars. Was your debt? The average debt right now, the mean debt students have is forty-nine thousand dollars. That means that half of them are over that at age twenty-two, at age twenty-three. And that is all because a decision has been made in this country that will give the money to billionaires and take it away from public education or even Pell Grants or things like that. That decision was made. And so, but the question is, given all that, concretely, or, or let, me, let me try to press you, do you have time to be working both on occupation and on student loan debt and going to G8, or do you have time, or, or do some of these things at a certain point, does, does a huge effort have to be made on any given one of these for it to be effective? No, I think, like, peop like people were saying about like diversity of, of, tax of tactics, like, more important to me than um, like one, sp one specific tactic is that if, is if we create like a, a, a real concrete student movement where um, we, we target things that address everyone, um, which is why I like, don't really feel married to any any particular uh, tactic, um, and it's kind of crazy that it's like forty nine thousand in debt. Like I wish I can get a salary of that when I graduate. Like it's. In oh, that was also one of the deals. The reason you got that debt was so you'd have a job afterwards, mm -hmm. and there are no jobs either. So. Yeah. Well. But um, anyway, well, let's c continue on. Uh, Emily, your thoughts on? Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, so um, in the short term, what I would like to point out is who's doing what, right? So I think as we build a movement, the first thing I'd like to move away from a little bit from my perspective is the idea that this mass movement that we're all hoping to bring forward in the next few months, the next few years, that it is beyond Occupy Wall Street. Right? I see Occupy Wall Street as a catalyst of something that's much larger than what that is. Because if we look at the, actual, the demographics of the majority of the people who are in Occupy Wall Street, it isn't representative of all of the people it wants to represent. So our goal needs to be how do we bring all of the people that we're trying to represent in this moment into a mass movement that's self-representative. Um, and I see that when we're talking about do we want to have one day you know, um, what was it, one-shot demonstrations, or is it more community organizing on a more day-to-day -day level that's, that attracts less press? I think the only answer is both. Um, <clears throat> and different people are attracted to both, so it isn't taking away one from the other, in my opinion. The people who want to get arrested are not the same people, in my experience, who are going to be, that didn't come out right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm not trying to. <laughs> um, when you ha um, I think that certain types of people, like young, excited, passionate, like blowing up inside people, want to get arrested because that's exciting, and that's great. 
because that brings attention to a specific issue and that's one type of organizing that we need to do. We need to have massive days of action where thousands of people get arrested and everyone in the beauty salon is talking about it because it's on the TV, on a loop, right? That's one type of thing that we need to work towards. The other kind of thing that we, didn't, we need to work towards is that once you leave the beauty salon and you walk out into your community, you can see, like the work that I do, that somebody's about to get evicted, but instead of getting evicted, as the marshal pulls up, there are 200 people outside of your neighbor's door, and half of them, at least, are your neighbors. You know, the entire community is outside, and it's not gonna get national press, and not everybody's gonna know about it, but it affects your life. Um, a lot more than what's going on in the news. So I think that dual kind of approach needs to be what's going on in the next few months. Um, and I think a lot of the, the archetypical Occupy kid, you know, as you see, um, who kind of might have like left school or dropped, moved here from Wisconsin and all of a sudden was living in downtown New York, like, um, that population of extreme, excitable energy, I think absolutely needs to be funneled into these one-shot demonstrations. And I don't think there's anything wrong with those one-shot demonstrations because they keep the awareness very high and they keep the conversation going. One thing that I really have appreciated is, through Occupy Wall Street, like it's already been said, is that in my house, the, all of a sudden, without me mentioning politics at all, with my parents and my siblings, it's come up over and over and over again. And usually I'm the one who's like, you know, rah, 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 rah. and I don't even have to do it anymore. The news does it for me. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. And I think that's been going on in lots of people's homes all over and in the bodega and everywhere. And, and that's what Occupy is great for. What I've been working on particularly um, is with an organization called Organizing for Occupation. And so like what I was saying is that we do things like eviction blockades where when the marshal is gonna come evict you, we get everyone to come outside and stand outside of a door, outside of the person's house and say, no, the person's staying here. And it's this direct action that, first of all, in order to do that, it takes weeks and months of collecting phone numbers, right? So you can have people to call on the day when the marshal's coming. And then every single day you have to call the marshal at 4 p.m. and say, uh, is there gonna be an, evic an eviction tomorrow? No, okay, thanks. So it takes every day- Do they tell the truth? Shipping, Does sorry? the marshal have to tell the truth? On oh, absolutely. They can, you only that is can, so cool. You can only find out the day before at 4 p.m. But they will have to tell and you. And it closes at 5, but they have to tell you the truth. Well. And that's accountable. And it's, so it's, it's, it's this everyday little teeny bitty stuff that can actually lead up to involving communities. And for me, that's the crux of what I'm interested in. Um, I personally, as an as a activist, am less interested in one-shot demonstrations, although I love participating in them and I find them very fun and fulfilling. Um, what I wanna see personally in New York City is more integration of the most marginalized populations. Um, and I wanna see the movement being run and I wanted to see the leadership of the movement being run by frontline communities and by people who, the struggle isn't an idea, the struggle is every day, right? Um, I, I think that without that, I think without community organizing um, on an everyday level, I, I fail to see the, the real significance of what all of this is trying to uh, attend to. I think a lot of times, you know, organize, uh, occupy Wall Street, it becomes meta, right? It becomes like the conversation about the conversation. It becomes like, who do we want to be eventually and, and all of that. And I think that we, we can't stop attending to today. And we can't stop emphasizing um, that people are having issues today and that it's not reformist to provide a better life for someone today. And, I, and that's why I... I just, <laughs> I think when you, when you, being radical is being in the moment and having vision. Um, and so, and I think that's service providing and I think that is, and I think it's soup, like soup kitchens become a dirty word in a radical community where you're like, oh, that, because that's not, it's not theory, it's, it's not like the better society that we want eventually, but in my mind it is because it's attending to the people most in need in the moment. And I think that, that always has to be how, eventually that's how I want my society to be anyway, right? I want immediate needs to be treated as immediate needs. Um, so can I, I think- Can I, yeah, that's great.
Can, can I just uh, press you on three particular things, and just quickly, do you think that there should be occupations of parks again in the spring? You know, my feeling is that if people are like feel huffed up to do that, great. Like, uh, one thing that I learned personally, I don't know if people have heard about Bloombergville, for example. We so many times you get into an action and you try to you have such an idea of what is this action going to be and what should it be and 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 then you realize that people are what we're fighting for is democracy. <laughs> people are autonomous and people want to do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. So if enough people want to sleep in a park, bingo, mm -hmm. like let's do it. You can... And what about what about the May first general strike? As a person who's on the ground, do you think that's a sensible thing to be trying to pursue? I think it's cool. I, I am really interested and not super involved, but always very excited about the integration of labor and the more kind of like student-y Occupy mm -hmm. um, movement. So I think a general strike, I, yeah, I think absolutely that's a great mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. And I th also think it can, I like days of action that um, are integrated across all different mm -hmm. spheres, right? So we could have housing days of action where we like open a new public squat and then at the same time you're having a general strike of the MTA. You know, but, but um, and yeah. finally, what are you? What, are you going to be in Chicago for G eight? I will not. Please. I am so unemployed right now. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm that not gives traveling. you all the time to be in Chicago. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I'm not traveling anywhere. I have an unlimited for this month, and that's about it. Okay, very good. <laughs> so at the end of this thing, she'll be outside yeah. accepting your contributions. Okay, let's <laughs> uh, let's go to Stephen Lerner. So I'm going to try to speak at lightning speed to say a bunch of stuff quickly to stay within my five minutes. Um, but first, I want to make just an observation that maybe will seem obnoxious to folks, but we have many less people here for the discussion of what we should do than we have for the discussion of what the process should be. And I don't know if there is any lesson that we should ponder in that, in all seriousness, because it's like people have so much time. But here's what I want to throw out, four ideas. One is it's not enough to think of short-term tactics. And I think about it as a Stockholm syndrome. Most of the left and the progressive community has been in a Stockholm syndrome where we don't allow ourselves to have vision, where we've been held captive for so long by capital, we've been losing for so long, that we sort of now imagine nothing can happen. So we just need to start off with reinforcing what everybody said about if we don't free ourselves to have a bigger vision, there really isn't anything to do. And I'm going to argue two contradictory things, and hopefully they'll make sense, which is the first is, the good organizing that says we should only fight about what we can win at a point where we can't win much is suicidal because why join a movement that can't win much? On the other hand, if we just have a movement that's about achieving utopia, it's very hard and my experience to keep lots of people involved. So the question is how do we do both of those? And so one, this idea people have talked about this is a moment of hope, I think is absolutely right. And the idea that our I, I'll use the word enemies, other people may not want to, but the enemies of the, our enemies and the rich and powerful are terrified us is absolutely true. And we need to grab that and think about the next three or four months as a moment where we take our hope, their fear, a big vision and concrete work in a way that gives us a huge lift. And that leads me to sort of the idea of thinking about between now and June, how do we think about escalating inter interrelated activity that creates the opportunity to engage the most people at the level that they're ready to be engaged. Very similar to what Emily was saying. The folks who want to go to jail, hey, I've been there, I'm ready to go. The folks who want to occupy homes, but we need to think about this as a mass movement. And I understand what you're getting to, I'll come back to it, but I think we don't want to fall into the false, false choice because by nature, a mass movement has a lot of people in it and it can do lots of different things. And so we've had a couple metaphors here. We've had, for those who weren't here at the beginning, we had a marriage honeymoon metaphor right? We had an ecosystem metaphor. It's getting close to six, so I'm going to do an eating metaphor. So <laughs> I think about movement building, which has been a theme that Yotam talked about. It's complicated, it's messy, it's horrible, it's wonderful, it's ridiculous. It's all those things at once. But maybe the way to think about what we have to do here is we're cooking together. And we're trying to create this incredible, delicious, spicy stew. And it's the process of the cooking that's important because we're each putting different ingredients in. And as they cook and smell good, folks who weren't part of cooking the stew say, hey, I want some of that stew. For those who know the little red hen, you can, from your kids, you can do it. And so it's the process of making the stew is important. 
and the ingredients in the stew are incredibly important, and then how we eat it and prepare for the next meal is incredibly important. So we have to get over this idea that it's one or the other, and so as I think about the next couple of months, is let's think about, and these are not exclusive, but some of the pieces of the stew, but the key idea of the stew is each one is better together. They're not one-offs. Remember, if you just have carrots in your soup, very boring. You need some cayenne pepper. You know, you need some other things. You need all the different things, unless you're a bland person, in which case you may not have a place in this movement. So, <laughs> I know, I just had to say something bland, people are welcome to. But anyway, so let me just throw out a couple ideas here. One, I think a theme here that's really important is occupy homes as a key part of the stew in multiple spheres. There's, there's eviction defense, there's folks who are moving back into homes that they were evicted from that have been sitting empty, there's a community organizing, there's a fight with Fannie and Freddie, but this notion that millions of people are losing their homes and we can physically save, that help them save it, very important tied to community, won't repeat what you said. The second thing, this question of moving money, which has mainly been an individual act so far, you know, move your account out of a bank, getting institutions, schools, universities, school boards to move money out of banks as a way to put them into either credit unions or things that do economic development. It captures both what's wrong with finance capital, but then it's something everybody can do. I want, to, I want my local institution to get the money out of banks, and in fact, it's infused by the energy of somebody just got thrown in jail for trying to keep their home. That's why I should move my money out of Bank of America, meaning they're not separate, they're part of the same thing. The question of students, not just student debt, student fees, student, um, and then the relationship to why education has been defunded is because we cut the taxes of the banks who then make the money on the student loans. It's all one story and we need to capture that together. And so maybe, on, I, I do think on a lot of campuses you'll see occupations, but on other campuses you'll see student debt. It's a mix of that, but the student piece, I won't go on because the student already spoke, is a huge part of how this stew is not just made of um, older white guys. Um, and then I think I went through another piece that you haven't talked about, we haven't talked about here yet, but there's growing talk, who knows what happens every May and June in the corporate world, April, May, June. What do they have? Annual, Annual meetings, shareholder meetings. We have this wonderful myth that goes on, which is corporations get together and they so-called have shareholders vote on what's going to happen. So a lot of folks are starting to talk about if we start with homes, we move to students, we move monies, maybe our goal ought to be able to shut down as many of the shareholder meetings as possible, inside and outside, saying this is where they gather to make the decisions about the fate of the world, and we're sick and tired of them doing it in a little room. So why don't we all go to those meetings? Five dollars a share right now, Bank of America. We should, you can all get in. Five dollars a share, they're collapsing. We can all go to Charlotte and we can be inside the meeting. If we can't be inside, we can be outside. And what better idea than the eyes of the nation will see the first convention in Charlotte, which is thousands of people coming to the Bank of America meeting saying, let's shut it down, both around demands, but also around the biggest idea that who the hell are these people to be meeting and deciding our fate without us there? And then if you add that all together and you mix it and you eat it, I won't beat it to death because time's running short, maybe we can think about what I think is really the place we need to get to, which is how do we give workers the confidence? How do we all have the confidence? How do we create a mood in the nation where we're occupying our workplaces, where we're shutting down our workplaces, not where we're shutting it down for somebody else, but where workers are sitting in, where workers are shutting down their places of work, and when the police come, when injunctions come, we're all there with them so that we can really deal with Part of the reason we are, that the economy is so screwed up, which is what everybody said, which is a few people got, got all the power. So to me, think Stu, think Hope, death to the Stockholm Syndrome. We can do it all. We got to mix it up. We got to make it big. And we're going to have a lot of fun. Thanks. And finally, Steve Max down there. Okay, thank you. I think we're all on the same page on this panel, and I'm going to give a view from the outside looking in, uh, because if you think of OWS as sort of an onion in that it has layers, then... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look, your opinion of the onion as a vegetable is not what, or any vegetable for that matter, is not what's at stake here. We're just looking at the layers. Think of it as a cake that has layers. 
Oh, uh, that, that being the case, the organization in which uh, I spend a great deal of, of effort, the Three Parks Democrats on the Upper West Side, uh, is in the outside layer of that uh, <clears throat> onion. Uh, we're part of the uh, people that have been referred to in, in the course of the afternoon, right, of the, of the tens of thousands of people uh, who support Occupy Wall Street but aren't actually a part of it uh, in that we don't uh, come to the assemblies and we don't uh, sleep in the park. Uh, but uh, we have come to all of the marches, we've come to all of the demonstrations. Uh, some of us were there at, at, at six in the morning when the park was going to be cleared out. Uh, in, in fact, the uh, Manhattan Democratic uh, County leader actually sent a telegram to the county executive committee telling them to go down at six in the morning, that they never do anything in support of any issue. The one thing they've ever done was support Occupy Wall Street. Right? It, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. Right, so we are, we are part of the strong political force, uh, community organizations, political organizations, unions, uh, unaffiliated individuals, uh, that can be a real muscle behind this thing, uh, but are, aren't exactly uh, of it. Uh, we voted in our club to support Occupy Wall Street, and now we're waiting to see what happens next and where we can fit in. But to tell where we can fit in, I, I need to tell you a little bit about what we do. Right? Now, we, we in three parks uh, have campaigns of our own. Uh, we're actively working to ban the hydrofracking in New York, your gas drilling. We're trying to close the Indian Point nuclear uh, reactor. Uh, we're opposed, opposed to privatization of the public schools. We're opposed to charter schools. We're opposed to social security cuts. We're for single-payer health care. And when we uh, endorsed uh, President Obama last month, our club president uh, felt compelled to remark to the membership that on every issue where we've taken a position, the president is on the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> so what we need to figure out, and what OWS needs to figure out, is where, where our interests coincide. Now, like most of the... Uh, tens of thousands of people who support OWS, and, and, and you mentioned it. Uh, we are uh, working people. We're people with families, kids in schools. We're retired people. We aren't going to spend hours at uh, meetings. Uh, we're not going to sleep in the park, although we admire those who do. And, and this is a critical thing. At the first sign of violence, we will disappear. Right. It, it, don't, don't tell us about autonomous individuals. Don't tell us about it's just another way of expressing yourself. Don't tell us about the bitterness is justified. Don't tell us that we bombed Libya. We will disappear because we can't afford to get beaten up and arrested. If we were very rich people, we could afford it. If we had nothing to lose with our chains, we could afford it. But we are the middle class. We're losing what we have already. We can't afford it, and we will, we will disappear uh, no matter who starts it. Now, like most of the people uh, in the groups that support Occupy Wall Street, but unlike Occupy Wall Street itself, we follow what you might call an inside strategy for social change. And that is we use elections, legislations, the courts, regulations, and add to that collective bargaining. An outside strategy is anything else, including civil disobedience and occupations. Now, the challenge to OWS is to develop a combined inside-outside strategy through which OWS can do what it does in its own way, and we can do what we do, but it all works toward a common goal or a common victory or, or, or a common issue. Now, there are some thoughts about that, and some of them have been, uh, uh, some of them have been mentioned uh, recently here. Uh, the environmental groups are already talking about sit-ins to stop hydrofracking uh, once permits start to be given. Uh, it has, it's, it's still not allowed in New York State, uh, but uh, the governor may give in, and, and that will be another area of, of civil disobedience, and we'd certainly like to see that. Uh, there's uh, going to be, uh, we talked about mortgage uh, sit-ins and, 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 and home occupation and so on, which is great. Uh, but we also know that there's going to be uh, a much stronger federal investigation of crimes by banks. And the more agitation there is at the grassroots, the more that can be kept on track. And the stronger that can be made to happen and the faster it can be made to happen. And so we'd like to see that connection uh, made there as well. Parents are demonstrating all over the city against uh, 
schools being closed and against charter schools taking over public schools. Uh, and that's another area where there can be an inside-outside strategy. But I hear some people cry, that isn't what OWS is for, we're for revolution. Well, okay, a lot of us wouldn't mind that either. <laughs> but but, but you've got to explain to us how that works. That is, if there's going to be talk about it, if it's going to be currently brooded about, then, then what does it mean uh, and how do the current tactics lead to it and just what kind of revolution will it be? Explain that to us. Uh, because it's not enough to say we have pluralism, it's not enough to say it's each individual's revolution, whatever you want to do, that's fine, call it what you like. Uh, look, here's the thing. My, 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 my communist mother told me that she had tried to explain to my great-great-aunt about the Soviet Revolution shortly after it took place. And my great-great-aunt said, well, they're not going to walk on my white rugs with their muddy boots. Uh, so what, what we want to know about is, is whose rugs are going to get walked on. Right, and we want to know, well, we're going to have to eat those awful puffed rice, rice, cake, rice cakes that taste like styrofoam. Is that, is that the vision of what this thing is going to be? Right, so I'm, I'm going to leave it here, right? There, there, there are tens of thousands of us waiting to be mobilized by OWS, uh, and we've got to know what, how we can have a joint program and work this out. So let's spend a few minutes up here on the uh, stage. People's comments about things. Anybody want to? I think we need a break. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you're, 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 we're going to have a hard break in half an hour. We really have to end uh, in half an hour. So let's spend 10 minutes up here and then open up to wild, wider. I'm going to be really fast. And I loved the last, well, I loved all of the interventions on this one. And so I don't want to be the downer, but that says, you know what? Occupy Wall Street's not going to organize you, but we're going to say, we'll help do facilitation trainings. You know, we'll help organize so that you're kind of self-organizing. And that, um, but figuring out that relationship is really important. As far as the whole question, though, of inside, outside, I think that's missing. And other folks from Occupy speak to this, but my sense in the U.S. and also being in other parts of the world is that it's not about relating to the inside or the outside. Our point of reference is one another. So our point of reference is not the state. It's not, that's not the conversation we're having. So it's a whole other, it's a different conversation. Um, and I love the, the Zapatistas use this expression that, you know, it's not going from below to above, but from below into the left where the heart resides. And so it's that it's us, and then it's us looking to one another. And then, yes, we totally need to talk about the transformation, the revolution. What is that going to look like? Is it a process? Is it a moment? Whatever. Yes, talk about all of that. Um, the last little bit I want to say, though, is about space, because I do think in the short term, the use of space is incredibly important, and I don't think that's the same as necessarily occupying and sleeping in a space. So similarly to around the world, where they stopped their encampments intentionally, or there were encampments that were evicted, people are organizing in neighborhoods and in workplaces and in schools, and that new space, but actually using space. Whether you sleep in it or not, I don't think is as important, but the face-to-face -face part is really important. And that's important, that's what we've been learning here throughout the US, throughout other parts of the world. And then Latin America, the last 10, 15 years, has been talking about you know, what they call territorio, which is about you know, when you shout that no, when you do the ya basta, or the que se va todos, whatever, the stopping of time, Walter Benjamin talks about, but then you open up something new in that space. And so that, the, the stopping, whether the picket lines and things like that, or the road blockades, but then creating the assembly and creating something in actual space where we can see each other. So I would push really hard for the use of space and whatever that means, but where we're looking at each other, where we're creating together, um, so we can create the new social relationships in this short term, but also long term. Did you, did you want to say something, Alvin? Well, this isn't quite on the point. Is there anybody uh, on what point are you? <laughs> well, I have, a, I have a modest idea. I may be the hundredth okay, person ahead. to let's, have it. Let's, let's have it. Uh, but you but there talk, was a, I have a modest uh, idea. You're uh, talking to the microphone. Okay. <laughs> uh, back in the days of solidarity in Poland, uh, there was a gentleman called Jacek Kuron, and when the workers went and burnt down the party headquarters, he said, "Found your own. Don't burn party headquarters. Found your own." So my modest version of this is, uh, has to do with coffee houses. 
I'm wondering whether there shouldn't be in every city an Occupy coffee house that is founded by the Occupy movement. Uh, there's a precedent for this. And, you know, of course, there's all kinds of precedent in Europe where the coffee houses were a big political meeting place. But, what, but nearer to home are the coffee houses that were founded around uh, US military bases uh, during the Vietnam War, which were a huge success. In, uh, in, in attracting soldiers to talk, to give an anti-war message, and the Vietnam v veterans against the war did that. So that's my modest proposal to throw into the stew. Oh God! Very, very, very pungent. Uh, Other, yeah, go, Tom. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to take a little crack at. I mean, I think I think the question has been raised over and over again, and and it's the the thing that's on a lot of people's minds is how do we build a mass movement that can accommodate all the different interests and, and so on. And I think what's on a, a lot of our minds is how can we um, keep the sort of radical edge that's, that Occupy Wall Street kind of uh, embodied, but it's not the only example of that, while also broadening. And when are those things mutually exclusive as opposed to when do they um, feed off of each other? Uh, and I think the, the question that, that you raised is what is a revo what does this revolution look like or what is that? Um, and I agree with you about the styrofoam tasting rice cakes. Um, so, um, I think that what it means, I think what it looks like is uh, building a movement that has the capacity to build the institutions of the world that we want while having the strength to uh, create the space for those institutions to grow. And so the implicit question is how do you build that movement um, and I think back a little bit on October 15th was one of our um, major demonstrations uh, kind of a, an international day of action and what we did in the city was we started out with a, a, a goal that this would be a multi-tier day that that we would make it a day that potentially everyone in the movement could participate on on the same day so we had you know five different issues five different meeting points students uh, anti-war environment, et cetera, jobs, and there were, there were five of those, and each of those issues targeted a bank. The students targeted the bank that was, you know, holding them in debt, et cetera, et cetera, and everyone did a different action in those. There was civil disobedience throughout the day. There were also, there was uh, a component where everybody met at Times Square for kind of like a big, powerful, relatively safer space so that, you know, I could get my mom to come, and then there was, uh, you know, people at home. Uh, like writing letters, uh, moving their money, things like that, so that literally everyone could find a way into that day if they wanted to, anywhere from civil disobedience to mass protest to being to to participating from from your home. Uh, and I think that that's the kind of movement that we need to build in general, uh, and that only that is going to put us in the position to be a critical mass to actually take any meaningful power and meaningfully transform society. And I, I think that also connects back to you know what a lot of people said about needing real real wins. And I think um, the question shouldn't be about whether we're willing to settle for, whether we're willing to accept reforms or fight for meaningful, for, for changes in the here and now. I think that's a given and anybody who thinks that it's not our responsibility to fight for wins today is kind of, that's kind of cruel. It's like all people are suffering now and we don't have the uh, we are, aren't, shouldn't be cavalier about that. I mean, but I think the question is, how do we organize for those things that puts us in the position to win more? And so the, the question should be, how do we fight? And which particular things do we fight for? So back to the student piece, that's a really good example. We should be fighting, uh, we should be fighting for students because there, you know, there's a reason that there were decisions made to put students in debt and to privatize CUNY. It makes it really hard for students to struggle. And if we win those things, we're gonna have a whole lot more people ready to join the movement. And if we fight for those things in a way that builds mass movement, we'll be stronger when we come out of it. So that's something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to enter a brief plea for tolerance and humility um, in that uh, I would like to see a movement that basically almost everybody on this stage feels they can be part of. And by humility, I mean that there have been many failed experiments in the last 100 years, and they've run the gamut from uh, utopian communities of face-to-face -face democracy to top-down vanguard efforts to mobilize people. 
And I'm struck, uh, as, as the day has gone on, the range of experiences here from people who have been transformed by face-to-face -face direct democracy, veteran organizers who've used vertical techniques to mobilize people, and that um, I know from my days of uh, my honeymoon in the 60s when I thought of myself as an anarchist that there was a span of years where I couldn't imagine any other way of doing it. It was the only way. Uh, and uh, older, hopefully wiser, I've come to think, no, let a thousand flowers bloom. And the challenge of a movement that's trying to be transformative and radical uh, to, to, to be diverse enough um, that it, it, it includes many people, but also to be willing to make certain hard choices of what are uh, of what the action commitment would be, what kind of collective self-restraint is necessary to create the broadest possible movement. And, uh, you know, I think that's the kind of choice point that um, this larger uh, mass movement triggered by Occupy Wall Street is perhaps at in these coming weeks. Okay. Other comments? Let me uh, put a question, a hypothetical question on the table. Um, I love this Bank America idea, $5, everybody in. Uh, let's say, for the sake of hypothetical, that it's happening the same week as G8. Um, ought there be a structure, a national structure of OWS to figure out a way of d dividing resources on this, for example? Uh, is there some way that you can that we can, uh, it gets to the question of leadership of delegated authority and, and tactics at a at a national level let's say for the struggle should we think in those terms or just whoever manages to get people at the different things will do that and that's all, everybody should be working at the same time i mean another way of putting this is does it does it do we need to try and think of of in some way maximizing our effectiveness and and how could we arrive at that marina says no no, okay. <laughs> and, and I, but I'm, I'm, I'm honestly asking as someone who has no idea. I'm just asking as a question, yeah. So I would say no also because I think we need to think not about coalitions or those structures but alignment and that so you can have different organizations taking lead and if – because the reality is if we said we're only doing Bank of America and not the G8, then a bunch of folks would not do anything. And so what I want to just is a, to try to get a little bit to the theoretical is in a movement building moment, I think we have a capacity to think about there's mo think about multiple overlapping circles of work. And so in Chicago, it may be that one piece of work we'd encourage people to add on if they're there is to shut down all the Bank of America branches since 50,000 people may be there. But that's not instead. And so I think we need to look at where are the natural overlaps in time, geography, and issues that then allow us to do much more at one time versus one arguing for choices that we don't have the power to make and second things that lead people out. And then just specifically on the, you know, you've raised the G8 thing. Um, I think we should think about in Chicago, are there more things happening than just the confrontation? If all those people are going to be there, then there's a huge Occupy the Homes movement in Chicago. There's a huge fight about all sorts of it. Whoa, he did, I guess he disagreed. Um, he's kicking the door down. Anyway, so I think that, I, I think it's a mistake to think we have to make those choices. The question is how do we layer things, similar to the onion maybe, I don't know, but in a way that it all fits together and lets us do more. I'll, I'll stay in the soup, right? The soup would be very boring if it was one thing. I just wanted to, I mean, part of, I'm not going to address it too specifically, except part of why I was shaking my head with the we is it was actually the whole framework of the conversation that was making me uncomfortable. So the, so the we, what are we going to do? How are we going to have this conversation? And kind of like what Emily was talking about is people self-organizing and mobilizing and whether that's local groups or community groups or whatever. But that's where the choices are made. So I was starting to shake my head more, not out of disrespect for the comment, but out of the whole framework of who is the we asking the question, how are we having the conversation? Because what has been so beautiful and powerful about this movement in the US and globally is its decentralized nature and the multiple we's. So that was my. I was just gonna add to that. And, and the fact that there are decentralized we's doesn't preclude acting on a national level. I mean, you can have decentralized we's coming together to have a particular national campaign and you don't need to have some central body, you know, deciding we're gonna do this one rather than that one. Um, 
I mean, that's, and that has been happening. I mean, insofar as there's a danger, it's a danger of different types of organization, you know, and how to deal with relations between them. And that's something we're still, we're, you know, we're still in the learning process, you know, because when groups want to help us or assist us that are vertically organized, there's always the danger of, you know, the sort of, uh, it's subtly co corrupting the, the, the democratic process. And um, so, so, you know, organizationally, the biggest challenges are, are, are that. You know, you have these three levels. You have the level of power, the institutional system, which is utterly corrupt. You have those people who feel they have no choice but directly, you know, engage with them in one way or another, um, even though they're not part of them. And then there's us, who are like, um, want to do transformative politics without either formally engaging with them or knowing exactly how to deal with those who do. Um, and that's where the real subtlety of negotiation comes in, because you know if somebody shows up and wants to help you, you don't want to say fuck off. But on the other hand, you know there's there's a million traps to avoid. So um, so that's something we're we're actually struggling over every day. Yeah. Just quickly, I want to. While, while you're talking, people should come up if they want to start asking questions. But go ahead. So I just wanted to say quickly that since the 90s, uh, with our exciting new digital communications technology, there's been global actions organized and coordinated that are still decentralized. So it's not that people are deciding that you're going to go to Chicago and you're going to go to B of A. But you know, Reclaim the Streets and before Seattle in 99 was creating these global actions, and it's and Occupy Wall Street has been working that way where. There's lots of stuff done in coordination um, without a real hierarchy. I also know that last year, before I got bronchitis and stopped following things so closely, that there were weekly conversations between a lot of the occupiers. There's a, a huge weekly conference call. But there's also all these other ways. People, people are coordinating in this kind of wonderful beehive swarm way that is incredibly effective. And so, and I'm, it's also like, so in a sense, it's like, who is the we? It's we are everywhere. And who's deciding? Definitely not those of us on stage, except in our local uh, and theoretical impacts for what we do. So, and also, Emily, we're doing great foreclosure defenses in LA, San Francisco, and a little bit in the East Bay. And it's really nice, because it's bringing together some of the young, young and not so young, radical, often fairly white, Occupy stuff, and a lot of people of color in uh, sort of the inner city. Uh, and a really nice non-hierarchical, we're not rescuing you, we're not telling you what to do, we're working with you, and it's also the sort of rebirth of ACORN, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Great. Uh, let's take a few things. Let's start with you over here. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about, in the spirit of, I think, Marina and James Miller, Marina, you talked about, like, the object of transformation is us, like us on the left. Um, I would say, um, and James Miller's sort of long durée of attempts at transforming the world. Like, sometimes when I speak to people who have very much dedicated their time and efforts into participating in Occupy, I start to wonder where the conversations about what has worked in the past, what hasn't worked in the past, lessons to be learned actually happen. And so that the way in which sometimes this gets resolved is by talking about like plurality, that everything can be done. But can we make like an assessment? Can we have historical judgment on the development of the left in the 20th century and say, well, this particular attempt at transforming the world didn't work because of the following reasons, and there are, in fact, things to learn as a movement from it, and that we should arrive at some conclusions about what's possible. And I don't know if those conversations are happening, where they're happening, and if they are actually affecting like the practice of Occupy. So I would just open it up, you know, if you think that there's room for that. Thank, um, thank yeah. you very much. Over here. Hi, my name's Alice. I was an occupier in Zuccotti Park, and I'm with Revolution Newspaper. And I wanted to put to this panel and everyone here, um, there's a call for mass action against the suppression of the Occupy movement and a day of action that's been called for on February 28th. And as an uh, urgent question, not the only thing in going forward, but a key thing, because those who wield power are actively working to suppress this movement and see it as dangerous. And the group world can't wait in their call against the crimes of this government. It says, 
That which you do not resist and mobilize to stop, you will learn or be forced to accept. And I feel we can't accept what we saw in Oakland a few weeks ago and coordinated nationwide attacks and evictions and the whole counteroffensive in the media that's vilifying us, that's saying, you know, w Occupy has gone away and now Bill Maher says he agrees with Newt Gingrich that we all need to get jobs. And, but what we can do, this is how movements get crushed and marginalized, but what we can do is call out the thousands and thousands of people who support Occupy to oppose this and in doing so grow and re-raise all the questions that have brought us out into Occupy and into the streets, all of the questions of economic injustice and inequality. And then secondly, um, just as a side point, I'm a revolutionary communist and I would love to talk to anyone who wants an explanation of revolution. And there's real and deep answers in the work of Bob Avakian and you could go to okay. revolution. Okay. You could go to revolutiontalk.net as a start. Okay, thank you. Percy spoke. Go ahead. I'd, uh, I'd also like to make a plug for St. Avakian, but uh, I'll, re I'll refrain. But um, there's been a lot of talk, I think uh, Marina gestured to this, uh, of Occupy creating these sort of liberated spaces, um, carving out a space in which uh, non-hierarchical uh, non and non-oppressive uh, uh, social relations can take shape. Um, I th I'm wondering if there's any room or if there's been any discussion of sort of the flip side of that, a sort of liberated temporality, a sort of reimagining of the way in which we structure our lives, how we spend our time, and the question of you know how how we can how we can live in such a way that um, you know in terms of in terms of revolution, there's always the question of you know is it is it a process, is it an event, are there turning points, or is there a certain irrevocability to uh, what happens? Um, you know, is this the kind of moment in which we could imagine, I mean, to sort of invert the sort of spatial idea, um, a sort of year zero, a sort of new, a new calendar in which uh, Thermidor has been stricken from the record, a, a, new, uh, a new moment in which, rather than the end of history, which has been proclaimed for the last few decades by various neoconservative uh, neo-Hegelians, um, a sort of beginning of human history, wherein humanity can then, from that, this point forward, make history rather than be made by history. I mean, these kinds of larger questions are, are, the, are the ones that, at a sort of global level, I, I would like to see on the table. I mean, we can talk about sort of... We've we got to let some of the other people talk. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, and generally, uh, as interesting as it, I hope that the questions will be more pointed because we have 10 minutes and then we have to leave. So that one's not going to get answered in the next 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> but go ahead. Okay, my name's Kenneth. Um, and, and the longer you take, the less time those people have. I'm going to try to be really quick. So essentially what I've heard alluded to here is kind of an issue of narrative and scale. Kind of like how do we command this narrative? It's so complicated. The scale is so large. How do we tell this story when all of these individual actions there's no way for one action to kind of tell this full story, especially when the media, you know, when they go to Occupy Wall Street, the only story they're interested in telling is, you know, how people are going to use the bathrooms and not kind of the full thing that it's addressing. And so, essentially, I think the idea that I have, which may have some resistance, but is this idea of um, everyone being kind of an agent of clarity. You know, if we have this stew, there need to be people explaining how the stew was made and how it got here. And even though we can't even though it's maybe impossible to agree on a narrative of how to move forward, there, we should be able to have a narrative of how we got here, so that way people can understand how the, you know, people being evicted from their homes and IMF meetings in Greece and student loan issues are all connected in this same larger issue that no one, you know, action can address. Anyway. Uh, in answer to your, your thing, thank you. Uh, I urge people to read David Graeber's book, which basically is addressed exactly like that, and it's for sale outside. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, oh there's, okay. I'm going to see you over there. Okay, very good. I, I want to speak to uh, Emily's uh, vision of the movement addressing the needs of those who, uh, who need it the most. Uh, and uh, there are some folks who are suggesting that the key obstacle to building the 
is left color blindness. Uh, I don't know where they'd get that from. Uh, but, uh, and, and, and they also say that the key to overcoming it is to put the struggles of communities of color at the center of this movement. So I'm, I'm curious as to whether there's anyone here who agree or disagree with that and what that looks like. We'll take t two or three more comments, and then we're going to wrap up quickly, and that will be one of the things answered. Go ahead. Okay. Hi. I'm, again, I'm a OWS protester, activist. Um, Jonathan, I wanted to talk to your point about the OWS coffee shop idea. That's great, but for me, it's like, how do we get these micro loans? You know, that's an issue of, like, reform after revolution. You know, that's, I think, beautiful. And also, Emily, your idea with... Um, or, yeah, talking about the acceptance of, like, not binary, like, having direct action mixed with, like micro-community um, foreclosure issues. And I really think they're the same in a way. It's like we're reframing what's important to us. And it's like, I think that's as dramatic and important as people sleeping in Zuccotti or sleeping in Sunset Park or wherever these like encampments come up because it's like we're claiming our public spaces and you know just reframing everything. So I feel like I wanted to say something else, but yeah, that's it, thanks. Okay, thank you. Let's say we really have just time for two more questions. Um, I guess I just have a contextual question. Um, I've heard a lot of talk here today about the left, and I think they're extremely important, but my other question would be, what about the right, right? Like, that there are other people who might be the 99% who don't necessarily know, you know, what this is about. My sister, she's not necessarily conservative, but she didn't want to come today. I think she has this idea that I'm somehow left of Lenin or something, and I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not. So how can we change, you know, and my husband's a veteran. He doesn't want to go to these protests because he doesn't want to get arrested. He's a veteran. He could get in trouble for that. So how do we kind of bring everyone together where it's like, I don't care if you support Newt Gingrich or whatever. This is about all of us being together and having a conversation about the economy and what we want for everyone. Great, thank you. Last question from on the floor, go ahead. Um, not so much a question, but a comment. Uh, brief. I wanted, brief. I wanted to bring up the Occupy the DOE action on Thursday night, which I thought was really like historic, or I mean, a, a big step forward, which my only disappointment is that it hasn't, as far as I can tell from like my Facebook feed, uh, sort of gone viral and generated anywhere near the level of discussion, but you had the situation where with about 2,000 people, virtually nothing, none, there was a minuscule presence of sort of the Occupy protester everyone's talking about. It was uh, the people who are concerned most about uh, public schools, uh, public school teachers, um, and mostly uh, people of color who are either parents or students at these schools. and. The striking thing was that this protest, uh, which was basically organized by people who had been working within the teachers' union for a long time on the left, um, with a, you know a limited amount of success with their various strategies, uh, they sort of adopted a certain amount of the OWS tactics. Uh, the people's mic was very central to the whole thing. It was terrifically disruptive, if you've seen any videos of it. Um, and at the same time, it like pretty much wiped out the official teachers' union uh, protest, which was basically an attempt to sort of uh, kind of have a protest without really standing by the parents. Uh, that protest had to ha pretty much had no choice but to recognize the legitimacy of what was going on in the much more confrontational protest. And it really, if you were there, you really got a sense of how just. Uh, these movement kind of tactics uh, of, of the people's mic, of a sense of everyone's voice counting, of a sense of the real delegitimation of uh, the sort of would-be rulers who are on stage, um, how much like a lot of people are really ready for that and, and want to do that and, and, and uh, are not, and, and at this point are starting to do that, um, that it's not as if, uh, um, I, I really thought it took it to a different level than just like even unions participating in some of the demonstrations in the fall, which was great, but this, this was at a whole sort of other, um, more disruptive, uh, sort of more uh, general assembly style thing, but not uh, the OWS crowd at all. Okay, thank you. <laughs> just, you have what, one sentence. I just wanted to say, uh, in this morning I was eating breakfast and I flipped through uh, the New York Post and in the opinions page there was an article, and I don't remember the 
author's name, but it was Harvey something, I, I believe. And he said that, uh, you know, Occupy Wall Street's not going away at all. I think he's gearing up for the spring as, as well as we are. But he was saying that it's only going to get uh, more intense. And he was saying it's, he, in the end, he predicted that it would be uh, more violent in the end than the 60s protests were. So kind of, I think, a sensationalist piece. I don't think at all he was uh, writing from the side of that uh, we're on, he's on our side and that no, no, we're fighting in, for him. In his dreams. Yeah. And so <laughs> anyway, I think, and what I've seen on the panel today, especially in the first part of it, uh, has been a real push towards the nonviolence of it all. So I was, I was thinking of the media image, you know, needs to get out there because there wasn't anything else in the newspaper that I saw giving off the point that it is, a, you know, mostly a nonviolent protest. And on the other hand, you know, would a violent protest, you know, organized violent protest, would they actually get the, you know, uh, minority and underdogs behind us in ways that would mm -hmm. spread the message more to, to everyone? Because okay. I can tell that this panel wants everyone involved, but how do you, you know, how do you present a media image that gets everyone involved? Thank you. Uh, we have literally time for like uh, five minutes of comments from up here. So uh, you wanted to say something about color blindness? Yeah. I, um, I, one of the things that many people are fascinated with the foreclosure issue is because it goes to the heart of wealth stripping from communities of color, which really has been so absent of much of the debate. 60% of the wealth of communities of color have been stripped since the economic collapse. And it's a direct result of that's where folks' wealth is. And that's going to, so really you've had 30 years of economic and civil rights practice uh, progress overnight wiped away. So I think it does go to the, sort of a theme that's been coming up here about how we're engaging both on specific fights, but it's part of a much bigger fight, which is, it's just extraordinary. And I, I don't know if people all, when you hear 60% of a community's wealth wiped out in one year of the economic collapse, and there's no way that that's gonna get regained sort of incrementally. So I think it's a really important point and something we need to think about more and do, deal with, not think about. Yep. Others? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. The, uh, the, the question had been raised uh, over here about what can we learn from the left and, and experiences of the left and how can we learn that. Well, what I'm doing is nothing but a cheap facade. I promised I would make an announcement and the announcement happens to answer that question. Uh, the Young Democratic Socialist Winter Conference will have that very discussion. It's next weekend, St. Francis College in Brooklyn, ydsusa.org. Get the information there. Okay. Uh, others? Jim? Uh, yeah. Uh, this is very quick. Uh, this is about year zero. I'm going to take that up. Uh, I think that one of the things that's really great about what's happened in Occupy uh, that has happened in um, uh, many of the movements post uh, Seattle is, and it's something that they have in common with what happened in 1989 with the fall of the Soviet Union, is that they're for despite um, the resurgence of utopian vision, there has been a, uh, a sense of open-ended experimentation and learning through direct experience rather than the hubris of the old-fashioned left communist organizations that thought they had the blueprint. And that kind of notion of you wipe the slate clean and start history over, we had democratic version of it in uh, the French Revolution. We've had communist versions. And I think the sooner that um, uh, movements for social change put that kind of hubris behind them, the better. We are, we are the slate that is, would be wiped. <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, Emily uh, first, and I'm gonna end with you, David. So Emily, Yotam, and then David, and that's gonna be it. Okay, I would just like to thank the individual who spoke to left colorblindness. I think it's one of the most uncomfortable things that people face, right? Um, when you're in a group trying to work for social transformation and you realize that the group is promoting the exact things that you feel like opposed to. And so without your consent, all of a sudden you're in the middle of re a reproduction of everything that you're trying to fight against. And I think that's why the colorblindness goes on. I think it's because it hurts so much to recognize that it's inside of us, that all of these discriminations and oppressions, <clears throat> specifically racism, in New York City it's so easy to see racism. Like, I think it's easier than in other places where it's more homogenous. Here where 
in the outside public is so diverse. When you get in a room and it looks like this, it's clear, right? So um, I just really want to thank you for bringing that up. Um, and, and it's duly noted, and I think it's one of our greatest challenges in this movement is to keep it as diverse as humanly possible. Okay, uh, Yotam, we have four minutes all together. You and David divided between yourselves. Yeah, I'll be, I'll really quickly. Um, I think one of the, only one of the ways, uh, but I think an important way to potentially answer the question of how do we, uh, how do we grow into a movement that's led by the most marginalized and oppressed people, uh, which is I think the crux of, of the issue, one of the ways is to, is to take on real issues and make real wins. And so that, yeah. uh, and, and I think that that's one of the directions that the movement is heading. That's why fighting against foreclosure is important. That's why fighting for a free CUNY is important. Those things uh, put the needs of actual human beings at the center of the struggle, and they move our movement from move our wow clever move our movement from uh, the from symbolic struggle to real struggle. And I think that that's kind of that's the direction that this movement needs to go. We've done a, we've had a lot of symbolic victories and uh, and and answered a lot of questions on a symbolic level, and we need. To to have real wins and create real institutions. Thank uh, you. And David, you've got three minutes. Wow. Um, I was kind of going to say the same thing in a different way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess what I was going to say, I was starting by thinking, um, yeah, we're in a weird moment because we've opened up these windows of hope and we really have transformed everything. But for most people, things actually are still kind of getting worse. Um, and we have to bear that in mind. I mean, I was looking at that, you know, we are the 99% Tumblr and, um, and, and, you know, just to remind myself when we're having debates about tactics or something like that. And, you know, there's, there's all these accounts. I mean, it's just, it's hard to read after a while. Um, you know, there's, I just were one stuck in my mind for some arbitrary reasons, this 15-year-old girl who's saying, you know, my mother works for the school board and we don't really get benefits, so I can't, like, I, uh, you know, I haven't had a medical checkup in four years. I think I have diabetes. I have all the symptoms. I'm really worried I'm going to go into a coma, you know, uh, um, this kind of thing. And I'm, I'm thinking, like, and we're arguing about, like, damage to a fucking window? I mean, that's violence, you know? I mean, the fact that there's people like that in our, our society, I have to live that every day. Um, and, but on the other hand, there's this bizarre fact that in, in some ways we're talking about revolution, in some ways we actually are experiencing a revolution right now. Um, I'm talking to Manuel Orstein, um, who I was very captivated by his notion that like since the French Revolution, all revolutions have been world revolutions. You know, the French Revolution probably changed Denmark more than it changed France. Um, 1848 happened in all these different countries, didn't shoot, uh, didn't seize power anywhere, but the world was not the same afterwards. Um, so same with 68. And we've had this series of world revolutions. And, and, what, what, and the other point he makes is that, that world revolutions, what makes a revolution is, is not so much its immediate effect on the structures of power, but that it changes our common sense. You know, after the French Revolution, there were all these ideas that everybody thought was insane beforehand, that power comes from the people, that social change is good, um, that suddenly everybody had to, had to believe. Uh, and, you know, so I, I wrote to Wallerstein, and I said, okay, so World Revolution of 2011? And he said, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, but we have, and it's true, because it's, it's a revolution that didn't start here. You know, it started in Tunisia. Um, you know, it, it traveled through the, across the Mediterranean to Europe, to Spain, to Greece. Now it's come here. It's a world revolution we're experiencing, and it is changing the terms of common sense in ways that will have effect for 100 years. We don't know what those are yet. And in the meantime, people are suffering more and more, and we have to transform that and take a hold of that transformation of common sense, the windows of imagination that opens up, and turn it into something concrete and real. And that's, that's a challenge in front of us. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Before, before you get up, I just want to thank uh, Stephanie and Camila. Where's Camila? Camilla. Camilla. She's back there. She's back there. Stephanie's over here. They put this thing together. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, thank you, New School. Uh, and NYU. Okay, very good. And, and you have five minutes to get out of here. Or, <laughs> oh, come on. They have a little more time. Okay. Unless you want to <laughs> occupy. <laughs> Thank all of you for being here. Thank you. <laughs>